This is a podcast produced by the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. Hello, my name's Diane Coyle, and I'm joined by colleagues in the Wealth Economy team here at the Bennett Institute. I've got the project leader, Matthew Agawala, and our special advisor, Dimitri Zangelis, discussing our latest report, Building Forward, Investing in a Resilient Recovery. In the two years since we started the Wealth Economy Project at the Bennett Institute, thanks to the support and commitment of Letter One as well as our research team, we've seen our work on improving the measurement and hence the management of the economy grow in importance and prominence. The insight that a sustainable and resilient economy and society require investment in the whole range of assets that constitute true wealth is shared by more and more policymakers and business leaders. This shift is welcome, but it's being accelerated by the fact that society is facing some profound challenges. One of these, of course, is the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on not only people's health, but economies and societies. It's highlighting the social fracture in the UK as well as other countries, the inequalities between people who have few opportunities to get on in life, between the places where they live. And so in this podcast, we're going to discuss the wealth economy approach to addressing these issues. We're going to look at the importance of social capital, the trust in society and social relations people have, the trust they have in institutions, about human capital, which includes health as well as education, about the importance of nature, about the way these map onto the geography of the country, leading to tremendous inequalities between different places, and about, importantly, what we can do about that, the positive steps that governments in particular could take from this moment of crisis in our national life to build a better future. But what do we mean by the wealth economy? For me, it's all about how do you actually tell whether or not society is progressing? Are things getting better for people in future generations, our children and our grandchildren? So it's very much linked to the idea of sustainability, both natural sustainability, but social sustainability more broadly. But we talk about the whole range of assets, the idea of true wealth or comprehensive wealth. So, Matthew, let me bring you in here and tell us what you mean by the wealth economy, how you think about it. I tend to think about things in as simple terms as I possibly can. And the way that I like to think about the economy is as if I was running a bakery. And what every baker knows is that the size of the pie he or she can produce in the future is dependent on the stock of ingredients they have in the pantry. And if they're running out of ingredients in the pantry, the future pie is going to be smaller. This is more or less how an economy works. The size of the pie, our GDP, depends on the stock of economic ingredients. Things like our skills and health in the labor force, things like our physical infrastructure, but also our natural environment and our social relationships and institutions that enable entities to enter into economic transactions and support human welfare through economic productivity. So you're talking there, Matthew, about things that we don't often think of as being hard-edged economic factors like social relationships. Why do they matter for economic growth? It's true that in most discussions about the economy, we often ignore the quality and strength of social relationships or community belonging. But the reality is they are actually fundamental to everything we do in the economy. Imagine if you're trying to purchase something online. You don't know the person you're purchasing it from. You're sending your money, your data, your credit card information, your address. You need to trust to some degree that somebody on the other end of that computer connection is going to protect your data, is going to deliver the product, and it's going to be of the quality you expect. And that's really important. If we don't have that trust, we cannot enter into economic transactions. Let me bring Dimitri in here. Uh, Dimitri, we're in this really terrible situation now with the pandemic and lockdown, the harm that's doing to people's health, but also to their livelihoods. And so there's been this phrase, building back better, a bit of a cliche now. We're talking about building forward post-COVID in the recovery. How do you think of that? What do you think it means to build forward? What kind of recovery do we want? It's very important to distinguish between the rescue phase of the current pandemic and the recovery phase. In the rescue phase, it makes no sense to stimulate the economy because you're actually trying, to some extent, to limit social and economic interactions. But at some point, when we get sufficiently on top of this pandemic, which we hope we will sooner rather than later, we're going to have to start very much thinking about the recovery side of things. And that means encouraging spending to overcome the paradox of thrift. Paradox of thrift is what happens when 
people feel very gloomy about the economy. And so businesses cut back on investment, they cut back on jobs, banks retrench on credit, and households stop spending. And of course, the very act of all these entities cutting back at the same time actually makes the gloomy prediction self-fulfilling. So we want to avoid that. So the primary task in the recovery is to get spending going. But then we have to think very carefully about what we spend on. And there's a general sense that we missed an opportunity following the great financial crash in 2008, where we actually failed to invest in a lot of the assets that matter. We're familiar with the fact there's a general underinvestment in the global economy. That actually is one of the reasons why real interest rates are so low and why monetary policy struggles to get interest rates to go below zero, which is a real headache for macroeconomic policy management. But it's also one of the features that has tended to lead, if you like, to the lack of productivity we've seen across the world. And in particular, we know about the lack of investment in things like physical assets, to some extent in human assets. But what we've tended to look at in the wealth economy are some of those assets that really are not growing at all. And in fact, if anything, are going backwards. Natural capital is one of the few assets that is generally believed to be in decline. And we've seen some of the consequences of social capital being undermined, as Matthew already mentioned. Uh, And it's not coincidence that these two forms of capital are actually amongst the hardest to measure as well. And that's why we've spent a lot of time trying to improve our understanding of those assets, our measurement of those assets, and then with a deliberate attempt to focus on the importance of investing in them and guiding policymakers in building the kind of economy that leads to the prosperity that Diane talked about. So one of the things that troubles me about the lack of investment, apart from the fact that we have very low levels of investment in the UK compared to other countries, is that it's a vote of no confidence in the future. And when you contrast how low our investment has been in that physical infrastructure that you just mentioned compared to the Victorians, Mm -hmm. well, it's just an extraordinary difference. And um, they built us 150 years' worth of infrastructure. We're just not doing very much. You know, it's easy to think about bridges and railways, Mm -hmm. but when it comes to something like natural capital or social capital. How do you think about investing in that? Mm. I mean, just you're absolutely right to to focus on the lack of investment. It's also worth pointing out it's coming at a time when there is very clearly a surfeit of desired savings. We've seen a lot of baby boomers moving into their prime saving earning period. We've seen middle-class China, which has emerged out of labour flows from rural areas. And a lot of these savings really haven't found a place to go. And that's why real interest rates are so low. And that's why governments are able to borrow to build up debts to record levels at negative real interest rates. That is to say, investors are paying governments to take on their debt. So this really is an opportunity. And indeed, it's a sort of rallying cry for investment. So let's take social capital as an example of something that's quite difficult to get one's head around. It's based on trust. It's based on, uh, it's often referred to as the glue that's all around us that makes social and economic interactions work. But it's very difficult to pin it down as a concept. Trust means you have better institutions, which are held accountable for delivering in the interests of citizens, but better institutions which deliver in the interests of citizens engender greater trust. So you've got this sort of positive cycle. And the question, of course, is the one that Diane poses, at what point do you break in to invest? Well, the fact that you've got this self-reinforcing virtuous cycle means that actually it doesn't matter. You don't have to pin it down. You can control the things that you can actively invest in. And that means investing in institutions, for example, investing in the trust that those institutions build. Some of that's got to do with spending money. Building schools, hospitals, justice systems, and so on requires some capital investment. Some of that is about the design of the infrastructure. So, for example, devolution, devolving power to local regions, which are often closer to the citizens they represent, and therefore better able to act in their interests than a centralized system. It might mean for example, investing in a national investment bank, which allows policymakers to take on some of the risk that they own in a way that encourages the private sector to invest private capital in greater quantities and the kinds of things that we want to support. Renewable, for example, investments, resource efficient investments that actually help us prevent the depletion of natural capital. So part of this is about spending money, part of this is about policies and policy frameworks, and part of this is about actually building the institutions that secure the kind of trust that enable effective and productive government to take place. I want to come back to that point about localism in a minute, but before I do, I mean, obviously, 
the economy is taking a hit, and so the government will want to get growth going and people back into jobs as quickly as possible, mm. and also be really worried about the level of debts that they're building up through this period when they're having to support so many people and businesses. So isn't there a, a problem there for governments who will be, on the one hand, knowing they've got to stimulate the recovery, on the other hand, they've got to bring the debt down? How do they think about that? Yeah, and this is one of the key differences that we're seeing. Thankfully, it's one of the lessons that we've learnt following the uh, great financial crash and the response to it after 2008, where after a few years of investment, policymakers became unduly, and I, I say this not just from a personal perspective, we've seen the IMF recently very clearly talk about not making the mistake again of becoming unduly fixated with budget deficits in a way that curtails an investment program after recovery and does so too soon. It's that kind of action, the austerity that we've seen, not just in the UK and the EU and even in the US, um, that led to the undermining of a lot of the trust in our social and uh, political institutions that we're suffering from now, but also provided the underinvestment that has allowed productivity and growth to languish relative to other recoveries. We don't want to make that mistake again. However, we are already seeing debt in many rich world countries reaching record levels, surpassing uh, the level of GDP in countries such as the UK and the US for the first time in post-war history. But there's plenty of scope for that to rise further. There's no magic ceiling to what debt to GDP should be. We've seen Japan uh, comfortably carry debt to GDP that's much higher than it is in Europe and the US for the most part, in most European countries. And we know that even though there are downside to excessive debt to GDP, it increases the vulnerability of economies to future fiscal crises, in particular, for example, if interest rates rise or if growth languishes. But we know that the opportunities and the benefits from investing in some of those sectors that we've talked about are much higher than the costs are at this stage. One of the surest ways, in fact, perhaps the prominent way of undermining debt sustainability in terms of debt to GDP is to undermine GDP. All rich countries that have successfully brought their debt to GDP down have done so in an environment where the denominator GDP has grown very fast. And that denominator will not grow fast if we fail again to invest in the assets that generate GDP growth. So it's really important that we recognize that right now the focus should be on sustainable growth, growth that's resilient, growth that's inclusive, growth that invests in the kinds of assets that we've talked about in the wealth economy in order not only to bring about prosperity, but to bring about debt sustainability as well. And that's why the IMF in its recent fiscal report made very clear that it felt that every dollar of public borrowing that is spent now in the kinds of assets that we've talked about, which includes resource efficient and climate resilient assets, generates between two and three, and in fact closer to three dollars in additional GDP. So it's an opportunity we must not miss. I mean, it sounds very persuasive to me that if you invest in assets that generate a return to society, then it's worthwhile when interest interest rates are so low. I, I suspect, though, that we're not going to avoid having quite a debate about um, getting deficits down as, as the economy does recover eventually, especially given that that's the philosophy of the government in power at the moment. And it's just important to be clear, you won't have those kinds of, we call them growth multipliers that the IMF talked about forever. At some point, the returns to public investment will start to come down, but that will be a symptom of success. At that point, real interest rates will start to recover and debt will be harder to sustain at the levels that we've seen it. But that will be job done, if you like. We are very far from that point right now. So the important thing to note is there's plenty of scope for investment in the short run. And I don't know how long the short run is going to be, but it's certainly the next few years. It could even be the next decade in order to get the world economy back to a productive equilibrium that raises real interest rates and that allows governments to come to terms with their deficits and their uh, fiscal balances. And as in we general. were saying, plenty of need for investment mm -hmm. too. Uh, I want to go back to this point about the geography of the economy, the localism point. It's something that's been close to my heart for a long time and I've been working with a number of English devolved authorities mm. on how do they get their economies to grow, what kind of powers should they see devolve from Westminster on top of the ones that they already have. And I think one of the things the pandemic has shown us is that the price that we are paying for being so centralised, because it's very hard for any centralised government, no matter how competent it is, to have the kind of local information that you need to respond quickly in these kinds of very fast-moving situations. And I think we've paid a high price for that. But I want to turn to Matthew about 
the geography in this particular context of assets. So what do we know, Matthew, about the geographic inequalities in people's access to these assets? And how does, how does focusing on, on the wealth economy speak to this question about inequality across the country? Well, there's a great deal that we do know about inequality in life chances and life outcomes all across the United Kingdom. We see that life expectancy differs quite substantially, even within one country. We see that access to education, the quality of schools in your local community, health, access to infrastructure. Are there good bus routes? Can you take one bus ticket rather than having to purchase three different tickets from three different bus companies to complete your commute? Different access to these kinds of public infrastructure has a huge impact on the life chances for those growing up and working in different communities across the country. And what this means is that if we want to actually deliver a leveling up agenda that takes places that have been left out of the benefits of globalization, left out of the benefits of public investment in the past, that have been left out of the remarkable growth story that much of the country has faced, we need to start investing in these public infrastructure assets, like public transportation, like green spaces, like education opportunities at all ages, including those already in work to reskill. And we need to do this in places where it might look as though the returns are pretty low because they maybe don't pass a strong cost-benefit analysis ratio at the moment because they don't have the jobs and they don't have the high incomes and they don't have the high-skilled labor force. But that's exactly why these are the places that deserve and need and crave the investment and where they will give it the highest return. There's no point giving an extra university degree to somebody who already has a PhD, right? We need to deliver the education, the public infrastructure, the health care in places where it's currently lacking. And that's how our investment strategy needs to change. One of the interesting things that, that you've been thinking about is the way that people's access to these different assets kind of interacts with each other. And so if you think about their um, human capital, as we economists call their um, skill level and, and health, and their access to nature, and their access to the social infrastructure and, and the public transport infrastructure you were just talking about. So does this mean that there's a scope for one of the kind of virtuous circles that Dimitri was just talking about in a different context? Is that something that you would see helping explain why we've got such big inequalities? I think that's absolutely right. There's, there's huge potential to focus on the mutually reinforcing, or as economists would say, complementary nature of different types of wealth, of our natural wealth, of our human capital, our skills and our health. And this is really important to think about. When we think about nature, most of us, we think about charismatic species, the ones we see on a David Attenborough uh, documentary. We think about experiences going to the woods or a nice beach, camping with the family. But if we dig a little bit deeper into what nature really provides for the economy, we find that there are loads of almost hidden services, if you like. So if we take just one example of urban forests and trees, we know that they clean the air, they sequester carbon, they provide a place for outdoor recreation, they provide a place for biodiversity, birds and insects and nice wild species. And all of these matter fundamentally for our physical and mental health. And our physical and mental health, in turn, determine our productive capacity in the labor force. A healthy worker is a more productive and more profitable worker. It also determines our impact on the NHS. If we are healthier because we have better air quality, we will have fewer incidents of respiratory illness. And then our NHS expenditure can adjust and won't be so dependent on things that could be avoided if we had better investments in natural capital. And so what you see is that investments in nature can actually improve returns in other areas of the economy. And it's not just directly on health. If you have a super efficient, high-tech, ultra-modern, just-in-time delivery system for your manufacturing plant. That's going to be more reliable, more resilient, more profitable in a world without superstorms and massive floods that interrupt those supply chains. And so we need to think about how we design our investments across the broad portfolio of public assets, which include health and human capital and skills and education, but also our infrastructure, our natural environment, and the strength and trust within our communities. Do people have a stake? Do they feel they belong to the community and that the community belongs to them? 
Will they invest in it and dedicate their time and their effort to improving it? So if you think about the map of the country, the areas of greatest multiple deprivation, uh, high unemployment, ill health, poor housing, lack of access to nature and so on, are the areas where the incidence of the pandemic has hit the hardest. And it's people on low incomes, people from ethnic minorities who seem to be hitting hard, hardest by this. So if we start thinking about what to do about it, what does our approach say about policies? And we started to touch on this, Dimitri, with spend on investment projects that will generate high returns. But are there examples around the world of anybody using this? Or what should we be trying to do now? Well, I mean, there is an example which we see every day whenever we read a newspaper, which is our response to climate change. Now, it's a particularly pertinent example because it shows what we can do when we put our minds to it. Climate change is something that will impact, for the most part and hardest, future generations and people in faraway places. It's poorer countries which are more agriculturally dependent with lower resilience to adapt and which are more prone to floods and droughts which will be hit first and be hit hardest. That of course is a problem because it uh, blunts the incentive to take early action. We can carry on the way we've always behaved and expect to do well for a while at least in the rich world. And yet we have taken action on this, and we've taken action on this despite the long time frames, despite the uncertainty, the risks of meeting unsurpassed thresholds, and we don't know where those irreversible thresholds will hit. And despite the fact that there is healthy uncertainty within the science as to exactly what each unit of greenhouse gases translates to in terms of human impact, let alone temperature change. So what have we done? We've set up a framework, often referred to as the Paris framework, which talks about meeting a two-degree target or indeed getting down to net zero in terms of our economic contribution at the national, local and global level to greenhouse gas stocks. And different countries and different businesses and indeed even households and consumers are taking different action in order to meet those stocks. And we've built the metrics. We understand what needs to be done. We kind of have a grip on what the policies and the institutions will look like. Have we done enough so far? No. But are we taking action? Yes. And we're taking action in a way that's going to radically transfigure the global economy in such a way that will generate a lot of benefits and a lot of opportunities. So you've got quite an optimistic take. I think many people would say, actually, not nearly enough has been done in terms of policy to address climate change. The two can sit comfortably together and can be, in a sense, summarised in a phrase that Paul Romer, the Nobel Prize winning economist, came up with, which is to distinguish between complacent optimism and conditional optimism. Complacent optimism, which I don't subscribe to, just says that we can just sit back and the new technologies and behaviours and institutions will just arrive as manna from heaven uh, and deliver us into a uh, low carbon resource efficient economy. That's not going to happen. In fact, not only is it not going to happen, the easiest way of doing things is the way we've always done things in the past. Nobody likes change. Scientists and innovators locate in the regions where scientists have previously located and they tend to sweat the techniques, knowledge and infrastructure of the past, which is high carbon. So to instigate a change, you need something else. You need a change in expectations. And that's where the other form of optimism comes in, what he calls conditional optimism. And this just says, if we want to create a low carbon future, we better get working on designing it because that future will be a function of all the investment in the kinds of comprehensive assets that we've spoken about will deliver. It's those assets and that investment that will generate a sustainable, inclusive, low carbon, resource efficient and productive future. And, you know, who doesn't want a cleaner, quieter, safer, but also more innovative, more efficient and more productive future. And we're seeing the first signs of that in the fact that we're going to get cheaper electricity and better, more productive cars. Whether you give two hoots about the climate, this is something we should probably have done anyway, but we never did because we never had reason to. I think those kinds of benefits will become broader. And when people realize the opportunities, that's when you're going to see a tipping point in action towards a low carbon economy. And we're seeing the start of that now. Do you think, um, either of you think that the current shock to society and the economy is actually going to tilt the balance much more firmly in favour of doing things? I've been doing a piece of research looking at how much people value things they don't have to pay for mm. by surveying them. Mm. And this started out being about digital goods, but we stuck in some other free goods like public parks. And running the surveys in February this year, 2020, and again in May, the value that people assign to being able to go to the park shot up. So it's a little bit of empirical evidence about the thing people talk about, that there is an appetite for 
I don't know, the healing power of nature, the, the, the pleasure that you get, the well-being that you get from being out in it. But does this really terrible shock to the economy mean that there's an opportunity to do things differently? <laughs> I think there is an opportunity to do things differently. Whether we take that opportunity or not is another matter. In some ways, we seem to be a species that's good at returning to normal. There is some sort of inertia behind business as usual. We have major forest fires in California, and then we rebuild the same houses in the same places. We have earthquakes or we have financial crises, and we tend not to really implement the sorts of policies that would protect us, either by building better buildings or stricter regulation in financial markets. And so we, we sometimes shoot ourselves in the foot, you know, refuse to learn a lesson. On the other hand, people are already making some pretty substantive changes this time around. People are moving homes. That's a tough thing to do. And they're moving homes so that they can have more green space. They want a garden. They want to be able to work from home and have an office. They want to have space to have cooking at home, larger kitchens. If you look at the UK's housing stock over the past half century, the kitchen has been the room that has shrunk the most. And this is largely because people don't cook at home and entertain at home. We go out now. But seeing the risks that this imposes when we're in the midst of a pandemic, there may be some structural shift and we may change back. And so that there is potentially some room for optimism here. But you're talking about what people can do as individuals. Actually, I've got a very large kitchen, but I'm absolutely atypical. What about governments? What's going to make them see that this wealth economy approach and the need to invest is important and should be prioritised as they scramble to deal with what's going on at the minute? Again, the understanding of what affords opportunities and what is in people's self-interest is going to be the key driver of action on the wealth economy, as it has been on climate change. It's the realisation that you can do things more efficiently and reduce pollution and congestion and improve the livability of your cities that has driven a lot of the action. It's not a coincidence that the Paris Agreement was centred on voluntary contributions, a very big change to previous agreements. I think, echoing what Matthew has just said, you know, we've... Some people argue that you've seen six years of innovation in technologies and behaviours in the space of six months over the last year or so. We've seen a shift towards virtualization and remote working, remote access to healthcare, remote access to education, a greater focus on the efficiency of supply lines, the focus on green spaces that we've spoken about. Many of these changes, I think, now that the opportunities and the benefits have been understood, are going to be very difficult to reverse. In many cases, that's advantageous because it reduces the resource call on a lot of these activities by making them more virtual. But there are some downsides as well. Matthew mentioned the tendency towards suburbanization and urban sprawl, and at the same time, the tendency to eschew public transport. That could be very dangerous because you will start hollowing out cities, you will reduce the benefits of agglomeration, which are benefits of getting people to live in compact connected cities. It benefits innovation, it also benefits efficiency and is more resource efficient. And it also reduces revenues for public transport which might be used by policymakers as an excuse to cut back capacity and cut back modernization, which can very quickly lead to the death spiral of public transport because less frequent, less reliable trains make it even less likely that people are going to turn away from their cars. So policymakers have a really important role here in highlighting the benefits and the opportunities from making the kinds of changes we need. And that requires a wealth economy approach to highlight the complementarities between these assets, exactly the kind of thing that Matthew talked about. If you have greener cities, not only do you improve mental and physical health, you attract higher skilled, higher wage workers, which makes your city more productive, which allows you to generate the investment capacity to further reduce the city's resource call and climate and pollution impact. I'm quite sceptical about the idea that over the long term people will abandon cities. I think that they will continue to grow again as they have done for millennia so far. So I think we've got a few ideas. We've got the importance of investment and not worrying about the budget deficit until we get to the point where the economy has recovered enough. We've got to think about all of these assets as complementing each other so you can kick off a virtuous circle and get a higher return for, for those investments. We've got to think about the geography of the investments because we have an incredibly uneven economy in society and that's being made worse at the moment by the pandemic. What about what governments should be using to assess how well they're doing? 
I think one of the chief contributions of the work that's uh, put forth in this report is this message that we need to invest also in the statistical infrastructure to provide us the information in real time, if we can, about how our economy is doing and how our investments are performing. And one of the chief reasons for the chronic underinvestment that Dimitri has laid out in nature, in social capital, in human capital, and the uneven investments in these across the country has been because the returns to these investments are often omitted from standard discussions about the economy, right? The benefits we talk about, the mental and physical health benefits of urban green space, these are not traded in markets. When we think about nature and going to the beach, we don't sell beaches on the stock exchange and we don't buy clean air in the supermarket. And because of that, they don't often show up in official statistics. And so they're left out of important conversations about the economy. They're invisible. They're invisible. Not valued at all. That's exactly the point. When they're invisible, they're left out. It's As you're, you constantly remind us, when you leave these things out, you're implicitly placing a zero pound value to all of these benefits. And that's why they don't get the investment that they so desperately need and that the public desperately wants. We know that from numerous public opinion polls over time across the country and indeed across the world. People want nature to be placed at the heart of the recovery from this pandemic. In order to do that, we need to deliver a statistical infrastructure that's capable of measuring these benefits. It's capable of monitoring and providing timely information about the stock of these assets, their extent, their quality. And so we are working with the United Nations in developing this worldwide for environmental and ecosystem accounts. We're working with the World Bank to do similar things, extending into human capital and social capital as well. There are a few initiatives around the world to try and actually deliver the statistics that will help us manage the broad assets mm. that underpin progress. So we're, we're all economists. We love statistics, which makes us a bit strange. We're comfortable with the idea that you should think about things like nature or society in an economic framework at all. Mm that they have intrinsic value and we shouldn't even be trying to think about them in economic terms. So what's our best response to that? I think there are a great many very powerful reasons to protect nature. We might care about future generations. We might have a personal preference that we love nature. We might just understand that it is the right thing to do. But all of those reasons have existed for the past century and longer. And yet we haven't been able to protect nature to the degree that we need. We have seen over the past half century, 68% of vertebrate species see a substantial reduction in their population numbers. We have seen the release over the past century of one and a half trillion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. We haven't protected it purely on these moral and ethical reasons. So as economists, I think we have an additional obligation and an additional responsibility to think about nature through an additional lens. It's not the only way or reason to think about protecting the environment, but it's one of them, and it's one that if we ignore, then we are apt to produce policies that miss the investments in nature that we need and that will lock us into an unsustainable future. Human beings value an awful lot of things in often incommensurate ways. I mean, there are things we can put a price on, there are things we simply can't put a price on, like our right to life, our right to freedom, equal opportunity, respect, you name it. That doesn't mean that the best way to approach this is to, as Matthew said, impute zero as your value. Some things can be valued, albeit with uncertainty bounds. We're seeing that with climate change. That's why we talk about two degrees. That's why we talk about net zero. We know roughly what that means and why it's better than the alternative. We've put numbers in there. And as Diane is apt to say quite frequently, Statistics are the lens through which we see the world. If we don't have the numbers there and if we don't have the general focus and understanding of the state of these uh, core assets, we will do damage to them and deplete them. It's not a surprise if you know GDP is the metric everybody looks at, that governments are held accountable for delivering more growth relative to past governments and relative to other countries. And they don't focus on the damage that may do on the way. And that needs to change. And that doesn't mean putting a dollar price on absolutely everything that moves, but it means moving away from ignoring things, failing to see them, failing to value them, so that we begin to build an infrastructure and an architecture that develops policy frameworks that allow us to safeguard some of these core complementary assets and bring about 
the inclusive, resilient, sustainable and prosperous future that we all seek. So let's um, take a temperature of how optimistic we are that actually we will get this better visibility through statistics of what's going on, that we'll see a change in approach so that the focus isn't solely on GDP, that we'll see investment in communities around the country that have been left behind, as the phrase goes. And I must say I myself veer between being quite optimistic about it because it's clear that this is just a big moment and people are very discontent and do not want to go back to business as usual. And then on the other hand, quite pessimistic because it's a huge challenge. And governments, as Matthew, I think, was saying, oh, everybody tends to go back to doing things the way that they always have the minute it becomes possible. So let me start with you, Matthew. How optimistic? Um... I think, uh, well, let me put it this way. Anything that is not sustainable will not be sustained. It'll stop. It'll change. So our release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, that's not sustainable. It will stop. The growing inequality we have within the country and between individuals, between the rich and the poor, I don't think that's sustainable and that will stop. The question is whether we address these strategically and the change comes as a deliberate managed transition, or whether we push ourselves and our neighbors and our economy off a cliff and we stop these things through a crisis. That's the choice we have. I'm not sure that counts as optimistic, that you know we might be in line for a major crisis. What about you, Dimitri? There's a reason why you feel simultaneously optimistic and pessimistic. You're exhibiting the symptoms of conditional optimism. You understand what all of us here on the Wealth Economy team understand, which is that we're at a tipping point. Uh, if we get things right and we invest in the right assets, it will become painfully obvious why this is the best way of doing things and why we would never have dreamt really of doing things any other way. And therein you get the virtuous cycle that leads to the kind of prosperity that we talk about. But until you make that change, until you change expectations in a way that brings about a common understanding of the opportunities and benefits of making that change that then helps steer policymakers and businesses and individuals to make that change, the default will be to carry on doing things the way we've always done them. And we are seeing now that we are brushing up against the limits of doing that. And we are brushing up against pretty sizable limits that will bring about that unsustainability that Matthew talked about. So I share your kind of schizophrenic approach to this. I, I both struggle to sleep at night but I also have in my head this vision of a brave new world that is really, really close within our grasp and within reach. And it only requires small amounts of sensitive policy intervention to bring those about, which to me makes the challenge all the more urgent. Because if we miss this opportunity, we will regret it and future generations will suffer. Vision seems to me the key word there. I think a lot about the Victorians when I can't sleep at night worrying about <laughs> all of this. And the way that they did just build for two centuries mm. into the future. The infrastructure, I think I once worked out that the amount that was spent on the London sewers created by Joseph Bazalgette, which we are only just expanding significantly, was about £240 billion mm. in today's money. How many crossrails is that? That's quite a few, <laughs> isn't it? Um, and then all of those magnificent town halls and libraries and art galleries around the country, which are still among the finest buildings in all of those city centres, mm weren't all built by the government, many of them by private subscription. Mm. But there was a vision and optimism about the future, and I guess that's what we need to capture right now. And what we're trying to do with this report, which we hope all policymakers and anybody else in business or any power to influence anything will have a read. Anything else you two want to talk about? If we are searching for a degree of optimism here, we can take some solace in the knowledge that we already know what the things are that we need to do. And we have a track record that when we've done it in the past, it has worked. So we know that we can invest in better health and education for people all across the country, and that will have a huge impact. And we know that we can invest in better public infrastructure, and we know that we can invest in nature, and that this has a big impact, and that nature can rebound fairly quickly. And we know what we need to do. What we need to find is the bold, gutsy leadership that's actually going to bring us in that direction. Leadership really matters. And becoming a little bit more kind of esoteric here, speaking as an economist, I think the role of economics needs to be repurposed more imaginatively. Because if we're talking about visions, and we're talking about system changes, and we're talking about tipping points, then 
doing what economists have tended to do empirically, which is to look backwards in order to assess, you know, behavioral responses based on the past, is probably not the best place to get insights. We are talking about a step change in behavior. So stuff that didn't work in the past, including many of the technologies and behaviors that are going to make the future work, cannot be used as evidence of the fact that the future isn't going to work as we move towards a more sustainable economy. So we need to understand tipping dynamics. We need to understand multiple equilibria. We also need to look beyond our own discipline to get insights from an array of disciplines. We're a very insular profession. We need to look to geographers. We need to look to historians. We need to look to sociologists. We need to look to social psychologists to get our insights about how these major changes in behavior, in technologies, in production possibilities have happened in the past and how we might best garner the change in behavior and the change in policy frameworks and stimulate the leadership that Matthew talks about to bring about similar changes in the future. These are one-off step structural changes. They're what we need to trigger. And I think looking too deeply into time series based on the past, based on models that equilibrate on an equilibrium born of assumptions that we want to change isn't necessarily the most productive and effective way to do that. And indeed can lead to some pretty misguided policy judgments if they're taken too literally. From us, Diane Coyle, Matthew Agawala and Dimitri Zengelis, and on behalf of the whole Wealth Economy Project team, thank you for your interest and also thank you in advance for your support and action to create a fairer and resilient future. To find out more about the report and the work of the Bennett Institute for Public Policy, follow us on Twitter or go to our website, bennettinstitute.cam.ac.uk. Thank you.